the biggest thing is that trust is your biggest currency as a data professional, because if they can't trust you and the numbers you provide, um, you've already lost. You can be the yeah. best model ever, but they don't believe it. Um, you're not going to have much impact. So for me, I'm constantly thinking, how can I maintain the trust of my stakeholders? And it's why I put so much emphasis on communicating with them and building that buy-in and understanding and making it very clear, I'm doing my due diligence to work with you together to solve problems you have. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today, we have Mark Freeman. Mark is a community health advocate turned data scientist. His mission is to improve the well-being of people, especially among those marginalized. He is currently a senior data scientist at Humu, where he builds data tools that drive behavior change to make work better. He has a master's degree from the Stanford School of Medicine in Clinical Research, Experimental Design and Statistics. He also has a certificate in entrepreneurship from the Business School of Stanford. In his free time, he volunteers with the Bay Area Community Health Adversary Council. He also plays Division III men's rugby. Today, we'll talk about how to build data tools, data engineering skills for data scientists, how to pitch a project, and his career journey. If you enjoyed the show, leave a comment, give us a five-star review, send me a LinkedIn message if you want to sponsor the podcast or want to share your feedback. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for having me. Super excited to, to be here. So how did you get into data science? Man, I was not planning on getting into data science. I, I tell everyone kind of my, my story is I was going to be a doctor. Um, as you saw in the intro, I, I went to Stanford Med for my master's. And that was specifically make me more competitive for medical school. And I was at the School of Medicine, classes cross-listed with medical school students, like living the dream. I hate it being in grad school. <laughs> and I, I realized actually, like, I love learning, but grad school is not the place for me. And it became very clear, I cannot do four more years of this. And so essentially is like, all right, I, I have these uh, research skills. I have these statistic skills. And in addition, I was starting to learn how to code in, in R. Mm. And so essentially I thought, wow, data science is something that I can possibly pursue. In addition, being at Stanford, uh, just being surrounded by entrepreneurship and tech, mm -hmm. uh, it just seemed like a great way to bridge this aspect of like, my technical skills, startups in tech, and then also being able to scale my social impact that I cared yeah. about. And particularly when I first started in data science, it was really around healthcare. And it really seemed like low hanging fruit to really have impact um, in healthcare with data. Yeah. And that was actually wrong. Healthcare is really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you remember what was your first project? First project data wise. So I think the catalyst what that really kicked it off was I, I tell everyone about the Mar IO YouTube video by mm -hmm. Seth Kling, where they change a deep learning model on how to beat a Super Mario level. Yeah. And they showed like the little networks uh, working and everything at the same time. That blew my mind. And so that instantly like made me think I have to learn how to code. I have to do all this. Obviously, first off, I couldn't do a deep learning model. <laughs> like that was not going to happen. So I was like, all right, for, for statistics and like learning how to code, like what's a first project I can do? Yeah. I tied it to my master's thesis. So I told I told my professor, my my master's thesis advisor, I was like, I have to code. I have to have some statistical kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. And so my first kind of like actual analysis project and looking back at the code, it's probably like hideous. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it was essentially... I was assessing for SNAP, which is the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, whether or not well-being, perceived well-being among families mm -hmm. improved or decreased if they're on SNAP. And so I did a whole statistical analysis for a master's thesis. That was my first time writing R, made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Um, and and but learned a lot and it was able to actually just get something done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that process of just banging your head across the wall of like trying to like, I have this thesis, I need to graduate was enough yeah. motivation to push through. But I also loved every second of it. Mm -hmm. And I became obsessed with it. And then after graduating, I just continued on further. Yeah. 
Uh, I also learned R when I was in grad school. And also the way we use R is just fit a linear regression model. There was no concept of how to write a function, <laughs> how to code efficiently, uh, you know, readability, uh, not to even mention like object oriented or code a class. Yeah, it was a, a 1000 line script <laughs> where you just click run. Exactly. And, and hopefully it worked. And I think one 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 big takeaway was I remember I went to like the R counseling session uh -huh. and I was basically coding all my dummy variables. And there were like hundreds of them. And I did mm. them by hand. Yeah. And I, I went into this tutor and I like looked at horror, like you can just turn them into a factor. <laughs> I was like, I spent a week doing this. Yeah. Uh, but that's all part of the learning process. And now I will never make that mistake again. Mm -hmm. So during um, your, so after you transitioned to um, a company, you started working, what was the self-learning process look like? How did you later learn Python and data engineering and data science in industry? Yeah. So uh, your boy suffered from imposter syndrome really hard. <laughs> and so I probably could have been a data analyst or data scientist out of uh, grad school, but I was like, I'm nowhere near close. So I took an operations role in just a startup um, and just so I can get experience in tech. And uh, essentially on the side, uh, I would take the train one hour each way um, from Palo Alto where Stanford's at to San Francisco. And I would teach myself Python. So I mm. use DataQuest.io. I have a special place in my heart for DataQuest.io. Yeah. Not sponsored by them or anything like that. It just That's the tool I use that got me up to speed on Python. Mm -hmm. And because I worked in operations, there's a whole bunch of Excel work. So I started automating all of our workflows in Python. <laughs> also really bad scripts, but they didn't care because they mm -hmm. weren't a tech team. <laughs> and that's how I kind of got experience. Uh, I started implementing as much as possible. And then once I got more comfortable, I picked up a second job on the side uh, back at my university as a data analyst, where I actually got to like write code that was used for analyses and being published. Mm -hmm. um, so that combined with kind of like a lot of self-study um, got me prepared where I was like, all right, I'm ready to make the jump. Um, what am I doing in operations when like I have this job already showing me I can do this? So that kind of got me past the imposter syndrome and I went to a, a boot camp to really upskill on mm. the, the data science side and basically just force myself to be like, Mark, you're going to be a data scientist. Quit your job. Do or die. Yeah. <laughs> you make this happen. And <laughs> thankfully, my wife at that time was very supportive because we just got married. Mm -hmm. And then like a week later, I was like, all right, I'm quitting my job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But she was down for the cause, so she supports me. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so after the uh, transition, uh, when I look at your LinkedIn, so right now you're a senior data scientist and focusing on data engineering. And can you tell us how did you get into uh, the data engineering side of data science work? How did data science and data engineering marry in the workflow? Yeah, so... Uh, I'm, I, I like to joke around. I'm a data scientist masquerading as a data engineer mm -hmm. at my company, <laughs> uh, mainly because like someone had to do it. Uh, and I decided I wanted, to be, I wanted to be that person because one, I wanted to upskill, but also it was really fun. I started getting more and more obsessed mm -hmm. with like, how do I improve our data assets? Yeah. And so essentially how it started was I had this one project a couple years ago. I've been, I've been at Homo for over two years um, where... I was asked by the VP of product, like, hey, can we get me this analysis on this product product surface? You know, what what happened here, right? And it was scoped for five hours because it was like a simple, simple request, right? Yeah. It took me 20 plus hours to source the data and even uh, prepare the data. And I was like, never again, because mm -hmm. I also realized all my colleagues were doing the same thing for every single project. Coupled with the fact that we're all doing things differently, what was the source of truth? Yeah. And so that that is, I was just like, I, I can fix this. And so I basically told my manager, I was like, I want to solve this problem. I want to make sure every data scientist, every, every data analyst is on the same page when we pull data. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of my start, um, really figuring out that problem and just expanding on that, on that scope of how do I make quality data assets mm -hmm. for data science to work more efficiently and have a, a clear source of truth when we present results. Yeah. So can you share some tips about how to make good data assets? Sure. <laughs> that one's really hard. Um, 
the reason why I bring that up is like a big debate happening in the data space right now is like this return of like the importance of data modeling. Yeah, it's always been important, but it's getting a lot of highlight recently because a lot of teams were able to do a lot of scale with data with the modern data stack, mm -hmm. and um, they're able to build data assets really quickly, right? <laughs> But sometimes they didn't think about how it fit within the larger system of things. Yeah. And so I would argue, like, I'm still learning how to create quality data assets. So I'm not going to front as if I'm, like, some expert mm -hmm. on this. I'm, I'm just a data scientist who who's, like, I'm passionate about solving this problem. But something I really think about is that I fall back on my experiences in entrepreneurship. Um, so before Humu, I've, I've tried building companies. Okay. <laughs> failed <laughs> like many people but failed very hard but part of that process especially in the beginning is um empathy mm. you want to talk to your users potential users and understand what are the pain points so i use that internally so entrepreneurship within a company is that all right here's this pain point i'm seeing i see an opportunity so what i did to figure out what was like actually the need was i did a road show throughout the whole entire company oh wow first with data science and again that sounds expressive but it's a startup so there's like mm -hmm. 50 people yeah. <laughs> but i went to every department and went to every data scientist i said what are the data assets you use how do you use them how do they help you what are your pain points mm -hmm. and i got a whole spreadsheet of everything and from that i was able to quickly see what were the gaps what were people constantly going back and forth on Slack to understand what was happening with the data? And that allowed me to prioritize, these are the use cases that are important. And so I didn't necessarily focus on like, how do I build the best data model for everything? Because we're a startup. I don't have time to like build out this extensive thing because it's going to change eventually. What I'm gonna focus on is like, where are the pressing use cases? Uh, and from there, um, build buy-in for that. And I can essentially, deliver on those use cases over and over again. And through that, I get trust into, into this vision that I, I'm setting forth like, hey, we can have data assets that are valuable to people. Mm -hmm. We can build out processes for that. And you know, you may see that earlier as a data person, yeah. but everyone else doesn't see that. And so right. you have to sell that vision and doing that is going after low hanging fruit really first and making it very clear to people why this is important. Yeah. I want to talk more about how to pitch a data project later, um, but I think a good starting point is exactly like you mentioned, to have empathy and to listen. And I think this is very impressive because a lot of times in a startup, nobody tells you what to do. I'm sure your boss didn't say, hey, you need to do a road show because you really want to make this project um, successful and uh, you want to build something useful. So you have the idea to uh, talk to different users, go to different teams. So I think it's really important sometimes to not just do exactly what your manager, what your team want to do, and uh, just think, okay, if I want this to be successful, what are the necessary steps? Who are the people I need to talk to instead of just get the instruction and put your head down and do work? And if you want to be a good data scientist or data engineer, you always collaborate with a different teams from different domains and you have to uh, talk to people. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that part is probably very important for the success of your project. I would 100% agree. And and the thing is too, is like, it's beyond fact finding, yeah. but also like, what is the language that your stakeholders are using right. so that you can best translate to them the need? Mm -hmm. Because people really don't care about your problems. They care about their own problems. Mm -hmm. So if you can translate your problem into language that connects to theirs, yeah. it makes it much more impactful for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you previously mentioned uh, building data models for folks who are not uh, familiar with the concept. Can you explain in your definition what is data modeling? Yeah. Oh, this is a, a big, big question. <laughs> um, data, we have data, five hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. data engineers and data architects, please do not hurt me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but essentially, um, the way, way I kind of view it is shout out to uh bill emman who's basically like the the, the grandfather of like mm. um of of data warehouses okay. but the way he describes like a data warehouse is essentially serving as like a reflection of the truth within the business and so from that definition i think how can you structure your data in a way that 
can best represent how data flows in your business and mm -hmm. what actions are happening in your business. And so if you're just randomly adding tables to your, your data warehouse, wherever it may be, I mean, yeah, you get some data, but is it correct? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did it follow the right logic workflow? Are there duplicates in other areas? So now you're confused on what's the source of truth. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's it's really hard. I saw this LinkedIn post that was that was really great that said that how um, they talk about how like DBT data build tool is mm -hmm. really amazing for um, like helping teams scale. But he said it only count for like 5% of uh, improving data quality. The other part was actually improving data models. Mm. <laughs> um, and so that's something where in my data engineering journey, because I'm still very early in this, is where I want to improve at. And so I'm doing more research on how can I create um, strong data models. So um, Fundamentals of Data Engineering by Joe Reyes and Matt Housley. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm reading right now. And then also going into the classics like Kimball, Bill Amin, and it's really trying to understand, you know, what were they trying to solve for that? Mm -hmm. And then connect that to what's our current business use case at Humu. So basically, there's no fixed ways to build a data model. You just need to focus on the business use case and prioritize. I mean, there there are like certain patterns like star schema mm -hmm. and, and things like that. Um, and so that's going outside of my understanding okay. to where, where I don't feel comfortable like on a platform saying like, this is the way. Mm -hmm. It's more so like this is what I'm learning right now. And if you ask me in a couple months, I'll probably have a much clearer yeah. <laughs> understanding of that because also like trying to pitch to the company like, hey, mm. can we restructure our data model? Yeah, That's really hard to get buy-in for mm. because it takes so much time. And as a startup is like, you're wanna build features to sell. You can't sell a data model <laughs> to, mm. to customers. And so um, you really have to think, how do you slowly start implementing this? Yeah. And uh, previously you mentioned you were working on, on transitioning a lot of infrastructure to use uh, DBT and can you, uh, share with us what is the benefit of moving to uh, DBT? Definitely. So for, for context, DBT is data build tool. Um, it's by DBT Labs. And essentially, it's an orchestration tool to uh, help you manage SQL uh, transformations. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, say, for instance, you have like Redshift or BigQuery, which is like cloud data warehouse tools. Um, that you can run SQL on. You can either run them internally and maybe use like some scheduled queries in there to like actually like have them run at a certain cadence. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting to a point where like certain models depend on each other. Yeah. <laughs> and now it's like you have to figure out how to connect those all together. And so that's when orchestration comes into play where you want to understand how to connect different things. Mm -hmm. In addition, the challenge with SQL is like, it's not like Python where you can easily have it version controlled and use different um, like functions and things like that. Uh, DBT allows you to have version control. So it gives you more guardrails for, for your data. In addition, it allows you to use like macros and uh, they call Jinja functions, mm -hmm. which is another languaging tool. Um, so that way you can actually add like dryness, uh, don't repeat yourself, uh, to, to your SQL models, which mm -hmm. is like really powerful. So like an example is I wanted to create documentation for all my tables. Yeah. If, if certain things like, for example, like a, a user ID is like passed on to multiple different tables, mm -hmm. I don't want to have to rewrite the user ID column, uh, description for every single table. In DBT, I can just do it in one source and it will pass on to everything. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just a really powerful tool. At the same time, I want to heavily emphasize it's just a tool. So you can use mm -hmm. it properly or you can use it in a bad way and get into a bad spot. So a lot of people talk about modern data stack these days. So what do you think about uh, those tools people talk about in modern data stack? What do you think um, it consists of? Definitely. So uh, typically it's like, you have a database, data warehouse, um, and then you need to move data mm. from one side to other. And so um, the typical kind of pattern for, for moving data and transforming it has been ETL, um, extract, transform, load. That's been like a very classic one that's been around for decades. ELT um, isn't new, but gained more popularity where you switch the extract load to the beginning and then you have transform at the end. Mm -hmm. And so extract load would be like five tran, right? Where yeah. you're able to move something from say, for instance, like Postgres to BigQuery, mm -hmm. right? And then you have the transform, which is like DBT. And so that's been composing of the modern data stack. And then you have things such as like uh, Snowflake um, as like an area to store your data and things like that, um, things on the cloud and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so that's like, I think a core 
part of the modern data stack is like, how can you move data into an area that you just run a whole bunch of SQL on? Um, and then I imagine there's, there's probably a lot more other things to add on for like machine learning and, mm. and all these things on top of that. But I think the ELT aspect, that framework is like the core point of the modern data stack. And to kind of go a little bit further, like why did that come about? is that uh, uh, cloud data warehouses made the transformation step and mm -hmm. storage step really cheap. And so uh, now you can just dump a whole bunch of data into like a data warehouse, data warehouse, yeah. such as BigQuery and storage is super cheap. And then the transformations are super optimized mm -hmm. because it's like Google engineers <laughs> making, uh, like improving it. And so that's what kind of gave it rise mm -hmm. um, and made it very easy for teams to scale really fast their data needs. Yeah. Um Thanks for sharing that. And uh, now with a shift of tools, do you see, or for example, um, your friends or when you interview candidates, do you care about the experiences in those tools you mentioned or you mostly care about they write good SQL code? Yeah, I, I actually don't really care about the tools. Mm -hmm. And when I implement tools too, like one thing I try to emphasize with, with the team I work with is like, this is a tool we're using but let's not depend on the tool. Like what is the framework that we're using mm. and what's the tool that implements it? Because I just want to implement different frameworks and I can swap out any tool potentially, right? Yeah. And so I I don't care about the tool. You're a data scientist, you can probably learn it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I care about is like, can you write clean SQL code? Yeah. Can you debug SQL code? Mm -hmm. If two tables are different, can you understand why? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what I really care about more. Yeah. And previously you did a boot camp about data science and now your focus is in data engineering. Um, does it frustrate you that you're not doing a lot of traditional data science modeling stuff? I've come to realize I actually don't enjoy modeling. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like parameter tuning is like not fun at all for me. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm actually happy I'm not. But it's funny is like, I'll tell people like, I'm debugging a data pipeline. Yeah. And we have room be like, oh, I'm so sorry. That sounds boring. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, this is fun. <laughs> and yeah. so I think it's just my personality. I've, I've always been really into like digging into why is this data wrong and, yeah. and fixing it. As for like a model, like, oh yeah, I improved it by a few percent. Like I, I, I can't enjoy that mm -hmm. for a job, maybe for like a fun side project, but for a job, I, I, I haven't enjoyed it. Yeah, that's so funny because previously I talked to uh, Mikiko and she used to be a data scientist and now she's a senior DevOps engineer. And she, I was asked her the same question. She said, no, I moved to the dark side. <laughs> I actually don't really enjoy doing like feature engineering, building models, but I really enjoy like writing code, engineering part of the work. And in my mind, I'm so happy <laughs> there are people <laughs> like you and Mickey uh, doing the uh, engineering side of work, like data engineering, DevOps engineering, because I really like the analytics part of it. Mm -hmm. And when I um, was in Amazon, I had a coworker. He's also a data engineer and he said, when I connected to like sources in the pipeline, it's just like kids see candy. I get a <laughs> dopamine hit from it. It was like, wow, that's so interesting. It's really cool. People uh, feel joy in different ways. And that's why people often say data science is a team sport. Mm -hmm. We need people from different um, talent and have different passion. So, um, yeah, that's great. Welcome to the uh, dark side. <laughs> On the dark side, <laughs> hanging out with my friend Mikiko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when we chatted um, previously, you talked about the political side of building infrastructure. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Uh, so, again, thing about being in a startup is you're building the plane while flying it. Mm -hmm. And the goal, especially when you're a venture capital startup, is to burn more than you're making. Yeah. And that's very intentional because like they're giving you money to like scale and create like a competitive advantage with that scale. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, can you reach reach certain milestones? Yeah. And many times those milestones are related to like customers and whatnot. And what gets customers are different features <laughs> or like selling this, those features. Yeah. Um, I cannot go to a customer and be like, wow, I have this really nice data pipeline. <laughs> like no <laughs> one's gonna buy that. Right. Um, but it can help enable aspects of the product mm. that we weren't having before. And so when it comes to like getting buy-in for data infrastructure, you really have to make it clear of how does it create a competitive advantage for the company, mm. um, for a product or something like that. 
what is something that we couldn't do? Maybe it was like a risk or what is there an opportunity we couldn't do where we need this data infrastructure to actually make that happen? Mm -hmm. And that requires a lot of talking to a lot of people, yeah. um, understanding what's the business use case, what product features are coming in, mm -hmm. um, and then connecting that to like this overall data and business strategy that the, the leadership's doing. And many times it's not the actual infrastructure itself. It's this product features coming out. Let's attach this infrastructure project to it. Mm -hmm. So now you mentioned you almost done with the DBT migration. Yeah. So what is the most challenging part of it? The most challenging part, um, past getting the buy-in, <laughs> mm. but the actual, I think the most challenging part was just, uh, I think this is like, this is my first migration that I led. And so this is a massive project mm -hmm. and thinking through like taking off the data technical side and yeah. putting on the project management side and ensuring it maintains momentum and that you're reaching certain milestones and you're communi that, communicating that across. Mm -hmm. And so like, how do you break up this large project into a smaller piece yeah. <laughs> um, and increments and, and actually execute on it? Because I, I've been talking about it for so long. Now it's time to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for a POC that you do, that's really quick. You can whip that up in like, yeah. like, a, day, like a day. But like to actually implement like your production system, <laughs> uh, that, that, that had a lot more scale to it. Um, and so I think the project planning was actually the hardest part. And maybe because that's just a personality aspect of me and I don't enjoy the project planning <laughs> as much. But that was, that, was, uh, that was really hard, just like seeing this massive problem mm -hmm. and breaking it down to smaller parts. Yeah. So do you collaborate with data scientists in your company or you're building the pipeline for your company's customers? Um, so I'm all internal facing. Okay. So, you know, sometimes we have data scientists where they'll do analytics for, mm -hmm. for customers that'll go to like our customer success team to like present or sales team present. But my main stakeholders are internally, um, how can I empower people internally to use data effectively? Mm -hmm. And so my main stakeholders are typically data scientists, but also another one that I really care about is customer success. Mm -hmm. And my reasoning for like why customer success means so much to me is because they're the ones that are in charge of making our customers happy post sales. And so that's tied to revenue. And there's two people that's tied to revenue, sales and customer success. Yeah. Um, the reason why I don't focus on sales as much is because they are pre-sales. That's pre when we ingest their data. Mm -hmm. I don't have many data points to work with to actually right. like help them. Um, there probably are, but it's just not as easy compared mm -hmm. to like customer success where like I can see the product metrics. I can see all these other different metrics. And so my question then is, how can I make this data as easy as possible for you to understand for your customers? Mm -hmm. So that way, whenever you go into a meeting, you just look like amazing rock star. Um, even more so. And you're like, wow, you're so informed about our company is because they can easily access the data. Mm -hmm. And that's that's kind of my goal when thinking about um, in my internal stakeholders. It's like, how can I empower them to do the high touch things that can't be automated? Yeah, that's that's awesome. So when I was a data scientist, I had a, a data engineering counterparts and sometimes last minute I need some data from them or ask them to um, pull some data for me or for a long-term project, I would need them to create a pipeline for me. And those projects might not be the priority of in your roadmap. So when you're facing those requests, how do you negotiate with a data scientist, prioritize your work? Yeah, I think it helps because I'm also a data scientist. Mm -hmm. So sometimes just my own work. And so I'm just getting yeah. the data for my own work. So negotiating with myself. Yeah. But uh, many times, <laughs> like, for example, like, um, like a business stakeholder would be like, hey, we really want this dashboard mm. and we don't have the data for that dashboard. Yeah. And so I honestly rely on my manager a lot um, mm. who, who leads the data science team. And I kind of assess like, what are my main priorities? What are you trying to achieve and how can I help you achieve that? And then see where this fits in. And many times a lot of those things are deprioritized. Yeah. <laughs> um, and again, it's really like, I have limited time. The team has limited time because we're mm -hmm. a small but mighty team in a startup. And so I think it's just communicating clearly like, hey, this is on our radar. We'll prioritize it when it's important. Mm -hmm. But like if this is something that is really important, please let us know yeah. and, and we'll, we'll work on it. And many times they're more understanding because 
I found when they ask for data, many times it's a nice to have because they think, oh, yeah, <laughs> let me just pull this data. This I'm, I'm right. curious about this. Yeah. And it's not tied to an actual business objective. Mm-hmm. And those are the cases where I'm like, we'll put that in backlog. Yeah. <laughs> but for the cases where they're like, no, we're about to make a big decision, mm-hmm. then I'm like, all right, let me let me push off this one project. They'll be like a week later, but I'll, I'll focus on this right now. Yeah. So when you collaborate with a data scientist, what is something that they can do that will make your work easier or um, expedite the whole process to deliver the data they need to them faster? I, I think the, the biggest thing I always ask them is where in your workflows when you're trying to like solve problems with data science, mm-hmm. where what's taking you the most time? What's the most frustrating and communicating that to me? Yeah. Because again, like I'm, we're coming in early saying this foundation for we're really scaling our data to the next level. And so there's a lot of unknowns Mm -hmm. (laughs) and it's only one of me. (laughs) And so I think the more people that can surface those unknowns and like, I think sometimes people are scared to like say like, Hey, something's wrong. And they think they're like giving me all this busy work. Right. And that's not the case at all. You're giving me all these different data points and I'm collecting that to see like what's popping up over and over again to help Mm -hmm. me better prioritize what's worthwhile, what's going to move the needle forward. Yeah. So when data scientists try to uh, build their own pipeline, what are some common mistakes you see they make? Um, Well, I can talk about the common mistakes I make because I am a data (laughs) scientist that does that. I think one big mistake is um, when, so there's data pipelines where you're like thinking about like upstream, like moving data from like a data database to your data warehouse. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll talk more about downstream because that's typically yeah. where data scientists will be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Say runs are doing a bunch of SQL. Um, is I think one key thing is making very messy SQL code. Uh, I've seen this multiple times, including myself, where um, I'm like rushing to get something done. And I'm like, this is going to be a one-off case. It's never a one-off case. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and you you like alias your things it's like A, B, C, or give you like acronyms, right? Yeah. That like, uh, so like purchase might become like mm. PCH or something like that. And now it's in a pipeline. And now it's part of something that's really important for business decisions. And then it breaks. And then I have to fix it. And yeah. I'm now deciphering <laughs> the code that you have. And so being really diligent about like a style guide, being really diligent about like how do you structure your your SQL code um, for the love of <laughs> please do not use subqueries yeah. unless you necessarily have to because that makes things really hard. I love mm. CTEs. Um, but then also thinking further, like some of the earlier SQL code I wrote, that's like part of our data pipelines now. Mm-hmm. The one mistake I made was I made transformations way too early. And so, um, so when I'm debugging towards the end, I'm like, Hey, this value doesn't match. And I go back upstream and the value doesn't exist. And the reason why it doesn't exist is because I created it way earlier in the pipeline. Mm-hmm. Than I should have. And so trying to keep the data as raw as possible and like transforming it when you absolutely need to and making it very clear that it's at this end stage. Um, that's something that I'm fixing now. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned subquery. Why um, having subquery is bad? Yeah. So, I mean, if you have a subquery, it's not the end of the world. Mm-hmm. But say, for instance, you have like a subquery within a subquery within a subquery. Oh, <laughs> I've seen a few like of those. Like Russian dolls. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so essentially it's like you, you have to understand where things fit mm-hmm. in. Um, and what I liked about using CTEs is that you, you can name like the, the value of it. And oh, you, can you explain what a CTE is? Oh, common table expression. So mm-hmm. with, as, mm-hmm. uh, so you do like with, as name of table and then in parentheses, you do your SQL query. Yeah. Um, and so now it's like a, it's like almost like a temporary table in a way. Mm-hmm. And now you can reference it. And so something I like to do is like. I like thinking about what are the logical steps and kind of like kind of a function in Python in a way. Mm-hmm. What are the, the the incremental steps I can do to logically break it apart? Mm-hmm. And so that way is like much easier for me to debug. So I'm like, oh, this CT for this section name, this is having an issue. Let me go test it out here. And I can like basically modularize as much as possible my SQL code. Mm, yeah. So now with Pandas and some other Python libraries, you can do a lot of like drawings, filter, ranking through Python. And do you think we can do those everyday um, SQL work in Python? Oh, I think totally, totally is, is possible. I think it's just depending on what your company's doing. Mm-hmm. So at, at Humu, I just try to use SQL as much as possible because yeah. either I can write my own Python code 
or I can leverage Google's super optimized <laughs> BigQuery engine mm. to run and optimize my code. And so that's what I try to do as much as possible in SQL, then move it to Python when I have to or R. Mm. Um, but you can easily do that. And I think it's just a matter of like, what does your team prefer? Um, and so, for example, like if it's if it's something where repeatedly like the data scientists have to use over and over for this table, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to create some function in Python for them to like pull that. I'm just going to create a table asset yeah. <laughs> that they can all point to. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes like, yeah, there, there's like complex things where you like you. It doesn't make sense to do in SQL. It's way more easier to do in Python R. Yeah. Uh, do you still use R right now? Uh, yeah, yeah. So Humu intentionally does Python and R. Mm. And just a matter of like, what am I doing? So if I'm building um, scripts that go into our production eng code base, mm -hmm. I'm always in Python. Yeah, because uh, I, I just need to communicate with their system. But if I'm doing an analysis, especially if I'm doing like a report that goes mm -hmm. out to like leadership or things like that, you cannot beat R markdown. I love R markdown mm. so much. And so and also like there's a lot of statistical packages. So like we're, we're in people analytics. And so we do some like pretty fancy regression models. Mm -hmm. And so R is just really nice for that as well. Yeah. R also has a lot of good uh, time series, causal inference packages. Yeah. 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 We do a lot of hierarchical models. Mm -hmm. So um, our LMER package is really great for that. What's like a typical day look like for you? Ooh, a typical day for me. Um, so it really depends. Like I have like waves where. Um, I'm like project planning and strategizing mm -hmm. and then implementing. And so I can give you two scenarios. If I'm on the planning side of things, my day is filled with meetings, talking to people yeah. and like writing like documents, like trying to build out a business use case, mm -hmm. as well as like playing around with code to build up proof of concepts and collecting use cases and working with my manager and my teammates. Of like, how do we craft this like, this argument of like why this data infrastructure is really needed today. Mm. What is the urgency for it? Um, what problem does it solve? What is the very specific use case, right? Yeah. Um, it's really hard doing that stuff. And then taking that information and then kind of pitching it to people around the company um, to understand like, is this really solving a problem for you? Is there something in the product roadmap that's happening that I'm not aware of, mm -hmm. right? So that takes up a lot of time. Um, so I do that typically during my lulls. <laughs> And then when I'm actually implementing stuff, it's um, I break up my work. So I, I work now and I'm on a senior level. I don't have like tickets really assigned to me as that mm -hmm. often. It's more so like large, ambiguous problems. So like yeah. my manager will be like, hey, this new product feature is coming out. Um, we need to be able to track it and do analysis on it. Um, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. I love yeah. the ambiguity. That mm -hmm. that's, that's why I enjoy it. My manager mm -hmm. knows me well. And so um, from there, I use... Um, something I call my tribe framework. So uh, T-R-I-B-E. Yeah. Talk, requirements, iterate, build, evangelize. And those are the steps I follow throughout my day. So one, I'm going to talk about the problem. Talk. It's kind of like that road show, but if a ticket is assigned to me, I'm going to talk to the stakeholder. Um, from there, I'm going to figure out my requirements. You know, what tables am I going to pull from? What transformations do I need to make? Mm. Um, what's like the the end asset that that my stakeholder is looking for? Right. So once I figure that all out, I go back to my stakeholders and this is the iterate stage where I say, hey, you asked for this. This is how I interpret it. Does this match your expectation? Yeah. Many times it doesn't match your expectation. And it's because data is really abstract. And the thing I like to say is, like, think about one row in an Excel file. Now think about a thousand rows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's really hard for someone to comprehend, especially you're not working with data. And so when you bring it, take that abstract idea and bring it to them as a requirement. So I use like I use like paint <laughs> to like draw things out or like Google Sheets with like fake data mm -hmm. to like show them like, hey, this is what this output will look like. Mm. And they're like, oh, I asked the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. Or like, oh, actually, this is this new thing that like would make more sense if you like mm -hmm. adjust it. And so what that does too is like it builds trust with my stakeholders because now they're like, wow, this person really took the time to understand the problem. They're really making sure I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm explaining it properly. And that trust is like, like so valuable as a data professional. And so once I get that aspect done, um, then I build it. And so that's me doing the fun data stuff, playing around with SQL, playing around with Python. And I, I have that asset. And then the final step is the evangelize stage. And this is the most important stage. And I think a lot of data professionals miss out on it is that essentially most people are like, hey, I finished my project, Genjira, tickets Yay. done, <laughs> move on to the next thing, yeah. right? And actually, like, that's like the worst thing ever to do because then no one knows you've solved a problem right. and know that there's a solution out for their problem. Mm -hmm. 
And so I always try to answer three questions on the evangelized stage. What was the problem? What was the solution? And how can they start using it today? And making that very clear to the stakeholders that ask for the project or who I'm like serving, and also the broader company, if it, if it warrants it, of like, hey, there's this problem we have in this company, and this is how we're solving it. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, builds trust, builds buy-in, but also shows a track record of success. So people trust you more to ask for more complicated things. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I love the tribe framework. And there's one thing you mentioned that I really love. You said sometimes you need to show stakeholders a real table with fake data to show them what the output looks like. Uh, I had a, some similar experience that uh, uh, back in the day when I work with a new director mm-hmm. um, and his vision is some sort of a data lake and uh, his initial suggestion was, oh, write a document. We we review the document. What are the features? What problem are you solving? So we wrote the document for him. And it's just not clear. And there was one time um, me and my coworkers are like, okay, we don't really have data, but we just need to show him exactly what does the table look like. So when he sees the table, it's basically the same thing. You You can put it in a dog. Um, but it just feels different when you can actually see, okay, uh, what is the hierarchy? Uh, how are you going to uh, join? And then you can discuss specifically what do you want there? And then you kind of go back to the more abstract philosophical level because mm-hmm. eventually you still want to have some type of documentation to summarize the idea. Definitely. And I, I think the main goal is how can you make it as easy as possible for your stakeholder to communicate with you yeah. and more importantly, meet them where you're at mm. um, or meet, meet them where they are at. Um, Come meet me where I'm at. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not coming to you. I'm the data scientist. <laughs> uh, but like, for example, like if I'm talking to engineering, yeah. I have to approach them differently. If I'm talking to um, customer success mm-hmm. where they have never even looked into BigQuery, right? right. Uh, I have to talk to them differently. If I'm talking to other data scientists, they're mm-hmm. going to care about other things. And so just being very cognizant of who you're talking to and how to craft your messaging because um, then they can communicate with you on the same stage. And from there, you get way better information on how to better serve their needs. Yeah. It's kind of like creating a mini demo for them. It's a very simple thing. And like we just talked about, if you don't have data, just create a table and create some fake data. And uh, if you are building some um, machine learning model, even if you don't really have a product, maybe build a very, very simple um, interface so your users can uh, play with it and give them a few examples. Hey, this is um, one person's data and uh, the outcome of the prediction is this. It gives people more tangible ideas than just help people, hey, this is the accuracy, this is the precision and mm-hmm. recalls. I think we need both the aggregated metrics when pitch uh, to stakeholders, explain our model, and also at the same time, we need stories, the uh, specific anecdotes. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Whether it's a data engineering pipeline or data model or report, a lot of time, like you mentioned, it's not, you know, once and for all. People might have different requests for improvement Mm -hmm. um, and you constantly need to maintain the infrastructure. So, yes. (laughs) um, Yeah. Can you talk about how do you continue um, integrate, build the uh, data product or infrastructure? Yeah, I think the the best way for that is create a way to receive feedback, Um, especially when you create an internal data product. So if like your company if you just launch out a product and don't understand if your users are actually enjoying it or if they're using it properly or if it's still meeting their needs, mm-hmm. like your product's not going to be useful. The same thing's going to happen internally. And so for me, for example, like when I first created those data assets, right, it was like a V1. I created a whole Slack channel and say like, hey, I created this dashboard that's based off these data assets. So like anyone in the company can use it, but also for data science. If you come across a problem or if you have a request please go into the Slack channel and like bring it up so everyone can see. Mm -hmm. And so that I can be aware of it as well. And a key thing about that too, is that that way it didn't become Mark's dashboard or Mark's data. (laughs) It became data science data. And so people will message me directly in Slack. I'm like, that's great. Can you please put in the, in the group Slack channel? Right. 
And so that way it serves two things. One, it's not a tribute to me, so I'm not a bottleneck. Mm -hmm. But also the team can also triage it and see what's popping up. And it's visible to the whole company as well for whoever's in that last Slack channel. Mm -hmm. And so that's one one key thing is like create a channel communication for people to actually surface. And so what was really helpful is when I want to make those different upgrades, I was able to pull use cases from the Slack channel and be like, on this date, mm -hmm. this person said this, this problem was faced. On this date, they wanted this request. This is the pattern, right? right. And that allowed me to get buy-in to actually improve, improve it as mm -hmm. well. And so I think just opening up communication and having and that documenting it. and yeah. documenting it is really, really important. But also, like, if it's easy for you to implement, like, keep your users happy. Like, <laughs> constantly try to to add those adjustments if it's mm -hmm. easy for you to do. Um, another stage we're going for now. Um, is um, something I'm really excited about. Is like now we're like taking the metadata of logs of like, oh, we created this dashboard. How many people are actually using it? <laughs> what people within the company are using it? If it's not being used, why? And so yeah. now we're treating our internal products as if they're actual products in, in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just takes it to a whole nother level where now you can quantify if you're actually having impact what you're building. Yeah. So how did you develop your engineering skills? That's a great question. Um, I think the stubbornness, <laughs> that's, <laughs> truthfully, that's a stubbornness. Yeah. But um, I think that's how I started. But then how I refined it, code review. Um, I really appreciate the engineering team at Humu. Yeah. I I really attribute my ability to write production level code mm -hmm. is to them. Um, especially early off, <laughs> um, starting early, uh, shout out Miriam. She, she was the, 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 the lead for a very cool project I worked on. We implement NLP pipeline mm -hmm. and she taught me so much through code review and one-on-one -on -one sessions and providing mentorship. And so it really, it really took a team to, to help build me up. And, you know, how do I do typing? Mm. <laughs> how do I uh, use Git properly? Yeah. Because um, I was sending some nasty PRs with like 30 different changes. And they're right. like, Mark, please break this up. <laughs> <laughs> and so just very kind feedback mm. constantly. Um, you know, uh, do some typing, add logging, um, add this unit test, right? And so seeing engineering, doing code review and seeing what they're doing, and then also trying to replicate that, and then also getting feedback over time, you, you learn how to write proper code and like add to the code base. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to a point where you start providing feedback to others. <laughs> you yeah. start thinking about that. And so it really, um, I, I wouldn't be where I'm at without people supporting me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I recently saw you share something on LinkedIn. There are um, five lessons. So I think one of the lessons I really like, you talked about when pitch a framework, don't just pitch, oh, we're going to build a new framework, new pipeline, find a specific use case. I think that's really smart. Do you want to um, talk more about it? Definitely. So um, I think is that that post I was talking about is like, how do you talk to leadership? Yeah. Because they're they're working at a different level. So when you're an individual contributor, you're you're in the tactics realm. You know, how, how do you do something? Um, leadership's in the strategy realm. Why are they doing something? They're, they're not doing these tactical, like, I need to build these things. They're making decisions of, like, how to position the company for a strategic advantage. Mm -hmm. That's a really hard job. <laughs> um, doing strategy is, like, even though you're, like, maybe your output is not that much compared to, like, if you're an individual contributor, the amount of effort it takes and the amount of thinking and preparedness it, it requires and research is just astronomical. And so when you go to leadership and you're saying, like, you know, I'm going to build a specific pipeline and I'm going to use this tool. Like they don't care about that. Yeah. <laughs> what they care about is here's a specific problem that I think is impacting your your goal that you set out for this quarter. Mm -hmm. Or like here's a strategic initiative. I think that this aspect is going to be impeding it. Here is a potential solution, but I want to solve this specific business problem. Um, and it just so happens to use this solution. So tying is specific to like an urgent need within the company, as well as making it very clear of what problem it solves and what the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. Then you're talking to, to basically to the leadership's language. Again, meeting people where they're at. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, stay away from like the tactical talk of like tools and stuff like that. Yeah. I think yeah. it's always nice to set aside some time to just 
do whatever you want, uh, explore new tools, learn new things, and satisfy your curiosity. But we need to uh, separate that from a project where you need a lot of in investment from the leadership team. Like you said, does this in alignment with mm. the goals? And also the management, they usually don't like when you want to uh, boil the ocean, especially when you just join the team. Have you really spent time to understand how the team works? So if you say, hey, I'm going to build this pipeline that will help you improve the churn prediction model by 10%. And for this specific use case, maybe it really um, helps them reduce this pain point, and then you can build this pipeline you're also passionate about, and by the way, they also solve like 10 other problems. But if you just pitch the 10 problem at the same time, or you just paint the picture of this big idea about this new pipeline, the engineering team sometimes might feel like overwhelmed by it or feels like you don't know what you're talking about. Exactly, and also an another thing that I had to learn, um, and shout out to my manager, Stephanie, for, for teaching me this, was um, if you go in leading with the tools, like this is the solution I propose, yeah. instead of like this is the business problem, the impact it has, mm -hmm. If you go and talking about the solution, now you're debating the solution where or not it works. Oh, okay. <laughs> and yeah. typically your first ideation is typically wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in addition, by you leading with the solution, now you're like, I'm closing out conversations and feedback from other people. Mm -hmm. But instead you said, this is the problem. Now you're debating whether or not it's truly a problem. And that's a good thing. If it's not truly a problem, then great. You learn early on it, yeah. it wasn't worth it. But if it is a problem, like great, we, we all have agreement that this is, the, this is the, a challenge and this is the proposed impact it can have. Mm -hmm. Then you say, cool, we all agree on this. Now, how do we collectively want to solve it? Um, and then you can start getting feedback from engineering, other teams, like what's the correct tooling for things? And many times, like my first idea is wrong. And it should be wrong because it's the first pass. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, you want multiple different iterations from different people. And then mm -hmm. you get to a really awesome solution that's like overall bought in across different teams rather than you just coming to the sol solution yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, also another thing you brought up is uh, to drip awareness. So you don't just come in, knock the door, pitch the idea. Uh, I think... It's always a good thing when you talk to someone kind of in the director VP level in a big meeting, you talk to someone, work with them, but maybe in a similar level with you to just get a feel of what's their priority, what are interested in, and then work with them, um, get some feedback from someone they work closely with instead of just showing up a completely new <laughs> idea for the first time in a meeting. Yeah, people who are overwhelmed don't make great decisions and probably default to no. Yeah. And so if you just come to the table with like this full blown proposal, um, people are going to like tune out because they're just overwhelmed. And again, mm -hmm. think about how can you effectively communicate the impact you could potentially have. And so typically how it starts is that I just start planting seeds throughout, yeah. the, different, throughout the company. So like I'll post like, hey, here's this article on this different framework mm -hmm. that I've been reading that I'm interested in <laughs> yeah. uh, in different channels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll like tax them like, hey, I remember you were working on X, Y, Z. I read this article that uses this framework. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like really early. Then I start like, all right, here's this business use case. I start talking to people around the company. I'm like, hey, there's this problem I keep on seeing. Like, are you experiencing it too? Um, I start talking to different people, getting different perspectives, right? And so then when I go talk to, to leadership, you know, maybe it's like casually because I've been at the company for, for a while. It's like a startup. It's less so getting like that now that mm. we're growing. But like when it was earlier, I could just swing by and like, like, hey, can I just chat with you for like 10 minutes? Like yeah. a video call? Like, hey, um, I'm seeing this challenge. Are you seeing that too? Like for, for the teams you, mm -hmm. you oversee, right? Now you're pitching a problem, just like gaining more information, right? Yeah. Then I collect all the information and I work with my manager who who has a higher level view because mm -hmm. she's constantly talking to leadership and I start pitching to her because she's like my first stakeholder. I want to uh, kind of like went over, say, um, not went over in the sense of like, hey, I want you on my side, but more so like, is this even worthwhile to pursue based on what you're seeing and the goals you have? Yeah. And I'll pitch an idea. I'm like, hey, here's a problem. I want to solve it. Um, and, uh, she'll, my manager, Stephanie be like, yeah, that, I think that is a problem. We should, we should go for that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then the next step is like, I start creating documents. So, um, I start clearly describing what's the problem, 
why is this a problem today? What is the proposed solution of like solving this problem um, that can be changed later on? And then why are we solving this now? Creating that full document. And then from there, I invite people to provide feedback on it. Mm -hmm. Again, really getting consistent consensus and buy-in from different parts of the, of the company to really understand like how can we actually solve this and like who would actually want to solve it with us yeah um and so again it's very slowly mm -hmm. and then once we have that then we're like all right cool we have this this vision multiple people are bought in we've talked to multiple people across the company know it's actually a true problem mm -hmm. uh, and we clearly define why this is important now we have this asset that we can share with leadership and be like, hey, we wrote this document that we're thinking about X, Y, Z. Like, can you read this real quick? Like, just skim real quick. And so, for example, like, I'm currently doing this right now for a major project. I can't go into too much detail. But um, this was something that I saw a challenge with six months ago. Yeah. And I, I've just been slowly talking to people about that. And then I saw something in our product roadmap pop up where I'm like, oh, this idea can actually really impact that and make this actually possible. And mm -hmm. so it gave some urgency to it. Now I had an urgency moment where I'm like, there's urgency now. Uh, I can actually get buy-in for this. Yeah. And so um, I started working with my my colleagues in data science. So like, hey, let's work on this together. We created this whole document. We spent three weeks iterating on this document, mm -hmm. the different languaging, uh, language, language of it. And now, like, our next step is uh, my manager is like, great. It's now ready to speak to leadership. <laughs> Go set up a meeting with these three leaders. <laughs> yeah. And I want you to lead it. And I want you to basically understand, like, if there's really a problem for them mm -hmm. and how much they care about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And get their buy-in. And so, again, it's not just us jumping in saying like, hey, here's this whole full-blown solution. What we're doing is we're ahead of time providing them a document, going to meet with them in a very structured way and say, this is a challenge we see for you to reach your strategic goals. Mm. Are you seeing this too? If yes, where do you think of the spectrum of problems do you think is the most impactful that we can start solving for you today? Yeah. That's even before a solution gets there. Mm. And then once we get there, we're like, all right, cool. These are the proposed solutions. There's three different, four different solutions we're thinking of. Out of this, out of this, what pieces of it make the most sense to you, right? And what fits within your budgets or what fits within your timeline, right? And that's a completely different conversation. You're not coming, showing them more work to do. You're coming in um, something that Vin, Vin Fashista, he has a data strategy course that yeah. he talks about. Is how can you be a strategic partner to the C-suite? Mm. Um, is that being in data science, you're in a unique position to see the whole overview of the company because you have access to all the data. Yeah. And so you can essentially be like, hey, here's these signals. Here's an opportunity. Here's a risk. And come to the table to help that leadership do the strategy much mm -hmm. better. And so that's what we're doing here. Yeah, especially you're working in a startup and the team is very small. You have to really understand what a CEO is thinking. Um, and if you work for a large company, you have those all hands meeting, whether it's within your team, your company, attend it. Know um, what's on their top of mind. So uh, when you have a new idea, maybe you don't need to pitch them. You already know, OK, this is not your top priority and you don't need to spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. Yeah. Some something like something you can kind of get a glimpse of like what people are caring about mm -hmm. for the C-suite or like leadership is what are the blogs and ads that your company is putting out? because they're trying to position themselves in a certain way in the market externally. Yeah. And you can understand what position they're trying to make, mm -hmm. then you can deduce backwards of like, how can data help enable that? Yeah, that's a great point. And I also really like the part you mentioned, you write a dog and get feedback from people. I think getting feedback is a very smart way to drip ideas because when people give feedback, they're giving their ideas, they're telling you what they want, how, why they, want this to be successful so basically they're helping you yeah and they're contributing and uh, um once you create something uh, meet their needs it's more likely for them to collaborate with you or approve the project yeah and something my manager stephanie told me and she's like excellent she's like she's like one of the earliest employees at the company mm. the amount of things i've seen her accomplish and like get through is just astronomical like i like my my rule of thumb is wherever stephanie goes i will follow because good things will happen mm -hmm. and so for her a key to that is for the ideas I present, how can I make it seem as if other people came up with the idea? Yeah. And, and not in like a, like a manipulative way, but more so of like, I present this problem and I let people care about them, present their own needs. Right. And I just create a platform for people to share those needs mm -hmm. and bring that all together. 
And it's way more powerful for multiple people to share their own ideas and want that to win mm -hmm. than you just forcing your ideas on other people. Yeah. And uh, previously we talked about uh, data science projects never built once and done. Uh, <laughs> there's a constant iteration uh, process yeah. there. Um, sometimes people feels like, oh, I don't want to do a lot of iteration and maybe I just need to come up with a better design. And then they spend more time working on like documentation, planning, and they never really launched a project. I, I have a story for that <laughs> that yeah. I really learned. So uh, earlier I was telling you about how my colleague Miriam essentially um, basically taught me a lot on how to write really production level code. Mm -hmm. And my task was to take an existing NLP model and put it in production in our product. Mm. This is my first time ever doing like some end-to-end -end engineering yeah. thing. And I was I way overcomplicated it. I was mm. like, I need to have this monitoring and I need to have it like send out um, like the confusion matrix and like, um, is it actually correct? And how like all these things like bells and whistles that were not important of let's just get this in the product mm -hmm. because it was a V1 feature for the customer. So we were just trying to assess whether or not like this is actually useful for the customer. Yeah. And so she has to sit down with me and is like, Mark, you're taking a really long time on this. What are you doing? And I explained mm -hmm. and she was like, you're doing way too much just end to end. What's the simplest thing you can get from, from beginning to end. And when I did that, I quickly realized, Oh wow. All this other stuff I was working on to optimize on, was not important at all. Yeah. And so just focus on what's the simplest thing you can build end to end. Mm -hmm. And through that process, you'll figure out what's important to iterate on. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for um, sharing a lot of your um, previous mistakes. I think that's very useful um, for our listeners. So um, what are some mistakes you made in your career? I think the biggest one is like I almost lost a company a million dollars. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great story. Um, and essentially what happened is I, I provided the wrong numbers to sales. Mm -hmm. um, and it was two parts. One, I didn't understand the problem. And so I, 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 I did the data wrong. Mm. But two, I didn't communicate that there were preliminary numbers. Mm. Um, and so this is exactly why I created the Tri Framework is because I made this huge mistake. And it was my first data science role. And I lost the trust of the entire wow. sales team. And so now when I present to numbers, they're like, are these correct? Did Mark did this properly? Yeah. And it was a struggle to climb out of that. Yeah. And I never wanted to experience that again. Mm -hmm. So the tribe framework was me creating guardrails to ensure every single time I'm asked of something or I want to create something, I deliver it and it exceeds expectations every single time. Mm -hmm. And that I think that was the biggest thing is that trust is your biggest currency as a data professional. Because if they can't trust you and the numbers you provide, um, you've already lost. You can be the yeah. best model ever, but they don't believe it. Um, you're not going to have much impact. So for me, I'm constantly thinking, how can I maintain the trust of my stakeholders? And it's why I put so much emphasis on communicating with them and building that buy-in and understanding and making it very clear, I'm doing my due diligence to work with you together to solve problems you have. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that was probably the biggest mistake so far in my career. I'm about to make a whole bunch of mistakes in my career. Yeah. It's gonna be great. <laughs> I think the most important thing is to learn from the mistake. Like you mentioned, it kind of inspires you to come up with a tribe framework. Mm -hmm. Do you have a, a mentor or a favorite coworker that you learn a lot from? Yeah, so I, there, there's like multiple layers. Uh, to that. So immediately at my job, my manager, Stephanie, she has mentored me so much. She is an exceptional manager. Mm -hmm. um, both technically she's exceptional, but also as, as a manager, she generally tries to put me in positions to where I'm growing constantly. So I think a great example is right now um, I'm managing for the first time. I have an intern, right? Mm -hmm. um, very low stakes, <laughs> but she is intentionally like, I think one mistake I made was I created this whole onboarding document had this whole project and have high impact, right? She intentionally let me fail. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very intentional, like in a safe way where mm -hmm. she let me try something for a couple of weeks and I saw it wasn't working mm -hmm. and she allowed me to understand that why. Uh. And then she gave me feedback like, hey, you tried this. This is the outcome of it. Mm. Like, let's work together. Like, what would be something different you can do? Mm. And she's constantly doing that for me. She can, she sees what goals I'm trying to achieve. She gives me space to learn on my own. And sometimes I achieve and, and, I, and I do great. Other times I'm like, hey, I missed the mark. And um, she she provides great feedback. And yeah. that's that's 
that's a manager that like <laughs> wherever Stephanie goes, I'm I'm following you <laughs> 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 because uh, she's she's an exceptional exceptional leader, mm. um, and I I I really appreciate what she's done for my career. I think it's great that she give you the space to fail. Yeah. I think she also kind of curious. Oh, what if it works? Then that's awesome. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think where I'm lucky is that Humu, we work in people analytics mm-hmm. and a lot of these are IO psychologists. Yeah. And so oh. they're all, they have PhDs on like how to be effective managers. Yeah. And so I'm like really lucky in that sense. And our whole product is how can you make effective managers? Mm-hmm. How can you make behavior change to improve people in the workplace? And so we actively practice that. And so um, I think everyone at Humu is exceptional yeah. and extremely kind, and extremely talented, but also like managed really effectively. Mm. Well, since we mentioned that, what are something um, that can uh, help people make change effectively? So um, the first thing is buy Humu in your company <laughs> um, and and engage uh, in our in our nudges. But mm. say, for instance, you don't have access to our product, right? Mm. Um, I think falling back on kind of my, my community health background yeah. is understanding that behavior change is really hard mm. and you cannot will your way through behavior change. Uh, and actually one of my favorite behavior change models is uh, the trans theoretical model. Um, and they use it for smoking cessation. And so essentially is the way they break it down is that there's different stages of behavior change. And again, there's just one model. There's different models to view the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like you have this pre-contemplation cha- stage. I want to change, but I don't know how to. Mm. You have this stage where you want to try things out. Yeah. <laughs> and you try like you, you try that new diet, you try mm. that new workout plan, but it doesn't stick. Then you have the stage where you're actually actually engaging in it. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you have the stage where you're actually maintaining it. <laughs> um, mm. And so for those different stages, you need a different intervention to help you get to the next stage. And so for smoking cessation, if um, and it's going back to my community health background, mm-hmm. if you say that you don't want to stop smoking, you're a horrible candidate for an intervention and they will not force you or try to push you into it. Right. But instead, if you come to the table saying, like, I'm ready to quit smoking, then they're like, perfect. Great. Here's this. <laughs> here's this intervention. Please join. Yeah. And stuff like that. And so, like, forcing people into that later stage does not work. And that goes back to my earlier points of, like, mm-hmm. meeting people where they're at. Right. Yeah. Um, you, you cannot change someone if they don't want to change and they're not ready for, for the change. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now you have an intern. What's something you learned from mentoring someone? Yeah. Oh, man. that Mentoring's hard. <laughs> mentoring's hard. Yeah. Um, because I think something that I've learned uh, beyond just my, the intern I have, but in general, mm-hmm. like mentorships I ha- I've done, is... Um, you really have to be selective of who you mentor. Mm. And it's not because you're like looking for the best of the best. It's like, who can you actually help? Yeah. Like what is my skill set, and how can I help that individual in their current stage for this time? And a lot of people, they may see you like, you're a data scientist now. Like I want to do that. You might be the wrong person. Mm. <laughs> and if you, if you, if you end up taking that on, you're the wrong person, it's going to be frustrating because you're not going to be able to help them the way you want. But also on the other side, I've had a mentorship relationships where I cared more than the other person. Mm. And so now I'm like working way more than this other person. And like, it's not, it's not reciprocated. Yeah. And so I think the main lessons I'm learning for, for it is identifying people that are great candidates <laughs> to actually uh, benefit and for you to learn from as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's the first thing that I've been learning over time is like how to find um, great people that are great fit for that saying no a lot yeah. <laughs> for that because I can't help everyone and sometimes mm-hmm. I'm just not the best person. Yeah. Um, and then the, from from that is being very clear of like what can you actually help them with mm. um, and knowing when if you don't know how to help them, who's the person that you can point them to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, it's like keeping open communication, making sure they're comfortable. Like if they need help, they can just reach out to you whenever. So I have some yeah. mentees where I'm like, you don't even have to text me. Just put time on my calendar and I'll show up. Mm. Right. Um, and that works really well. Sometimes they're scared at first, but then they actually do. And I show up, they're like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> and so then I see on my calendar, I'm like, oh, cool. I can't wait to talk to this person. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, so what is the uh, important feedback you received that have changed your career? <sighs> it's asking these hard questions now. Important feedback that I received that has changed my career. I think uh, my my good friend Cixin, I worked with her in student affairs at Stanford. Mm-hmm. Um, I worked there for for a year. We worked very close closely, 
and I went into a new role and we were friends afterwards. So yeah. I said, hey, I'm going to this new role. Can I grab coffee with you? And can you give me feedback on our relationship? Like when we work together, mm-hmm. like what went well, what didn't went well? Yeah. And because we had that working relationship already and also we're friends, she was able to provide me really great feedback. And she was like, Mark, you talk over people all the time. <laughs> And she says, I know you. And I know you're not trying to be like, uh, like mean or anything like mm-hmm. that. It's just that you're so excited and your brain just fires off so much yeah. that like you just have to get your thought out. Yeah. And and that essentially makes you dominate the conversation mm-hmm. and doesn't have this consensus. Right. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you're so right. <laughs> like and so now like I. uh um, I have a notebook typically and like if I have a thought, I write it down mm. <laughs> many times like, oh yeah, that thought wasn't good. <laughs> like that, <laughs> that was, that didn't need to go out or like if, in zoom channels, I just use like the, uh, the chat feature mm. to ask questions and if it's important, people get to it. Right. But being very mindful of the space I'm taking and, and making sure I make space for others that completely changed how I collaborated with people. Cause yeah. now like I went from talking all the time to actively listening. Mm-hmm. And so all these things I was talking about, the tribe framework, talking to people across the company, all those different things. I could not do that if I didn't know how to actively listen and calm down. Yeah. Yeah. Thank uh, you, Sijin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure when you first heard the feedback, you feel like a uh, burn, but she actually uh, delivered very thoughtful in a very yeah. thoughtful way. Things I, mean, I asked for the feedback too. Yeah. And so um, also like I, I see, I talk about my stakes all the time. Like mm. feedback's a gift yeah. and I love critical feedback and I respect anyone who's willing to, cause it's uncomfortable to give someone feedback. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate anyone who's, who's taking a chance to, to speak to me about that. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't take it personally. I'm just mm-hmm. like, cool, that's great feedback. How can I implement it? Yeah. And what is something you wish you have done earlier in your career or something you would know earlier? I wish I worked less. Uh-huh. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I think something I really have. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I, I think I, I wish I worked less. Um, and I think a lot of it was a driver of like my anxiety yeah. and like and like um, imposter syndrome because mm-hmm. I felt like I had to outwork my situation all the time. Yeah. And you reach a point in your career where like early in your career, the more output you have, the more kind of little little Lego blocks you build and stuff yeah. like that, right? Yeah. The better. But then you get like further in your career and it's like, no, you need to make right decisions now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You're like, you can't do everything and you need to prioritize what's going to have the most impact. And if you try to do everything, you have no impact. And so you have to do substantially less. And looking back, I was like, wow, I did not need to work as hard as I did to reach the same outcome. (laughs) If I actually just took a step back, got some sleep and actually thought what's going to be the most important thing and say no to everything else. Yeah. And that takes confidence to be able to say no because if you're coming from a position where you think like, I, I don't deserve to be here. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know how I got here. You're going to say yes to everything to prove yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's just such a disastrous approach to things. And you're going to get burnt out and you're going to be sad. Um, and I think I was, just, I wish I was nicer to myself earlier um, and, and said no to more things. And like, I understood the value that I brought to both companies and also just personal relationships and everything like that. Yeah. Um, that's such a great point. I think also earlier in my career, because you have a lot of anxiety, so you feel like by working more, you're going to um, feel the part where you feel you're not good at. Um, but just because you feel like your plate is full, you need to take some time to think about, to prioritize what is really important. Yeah, you mentioned you used to have a lot of anxiety and imposter um, syndrome. Can you share your uh, mental health journey? Yeah, I love talking about this stuff because I think mental health is really important. Mm-hmm. And the more people talk about and normalize it, the the better. And so for me personally, like I, I've had like PTSD from, from experiences. Um, so I've dealt with anxiety a lot. Mm-hmm. And then also I was later diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Mm. And so just being neurodivergent is I've had to learn that my brain just processes things differently. Mm. And the way it processes, I can I can cope with that in a really negative way. So for yeah. me, that looked like working because if I worked on other people's problems, I'd have to worry, worry about the anxiety going on in my head. Mm-hmm. And so um, for me personally is like a whole bunch of therapy, mm-hmm. <laughs> group therapy, one-on-one therapy. That was a game changer to really, for me to start labeling what was happening And then have coping skills. So when I do get anxious, I'm like, oh, it's just anxiety. It's going to pass in 20 minutes. 
Um, let me do some deep breathing. Let me yeah. do some grounding, right? And I have skills to actually bring myself down and calm myself down, mm-hmm. right? Or if I get into a bad mental headspace, I know just take a step back. And that if I keep on working and not sleeping, it's only going to get worse, right? And so for me is really going through therapy, uh, getting medication that helps me out a lot too. Mm-hmm. Um, and things like, I remember when I first started having my symptoms where it was just like horrendous and I almost, I almost didn't graduate Stanford. I almost mm. dropped out because it got so bad. Yeah. Um, is at that point, it was a very low point. And I thought, wow, I'm never going to be able to graduate. I'm not going to be able to hold a job. Mm. Um, my girlfriend at that time, who's not my wife, was going to leave me. <laughs> <laughs> she did it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that was a really hard time. And I thought mm. like, wow, I'm just, I'm broken. Right. Mm. And, When you're in that state, it's really hard to get out of there. But if you keep on pushing, keep on doing the skills and find better coping mechanisms, I'm living my dream career. I I have my wife and my dog. Yeah. Um, And I have a lot more confidence in myself. And um, it just had to trust the process that it will be better over time Mm -hmm. because I was putting in the work to improve myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What are some other things, uh, maybe, or books, resources, that might be helpful for our listeners. Oh, that's, I think the biggest thing is um, dia- diaphragmatic breathing. So like mm. deep belly breathing and um, looking into that because essentially what happens is that triggers your parasympath- parasympathetic, parasympathetic mm. um, nervous system, which controls your fight or flight system. Yeah. And so you can basically hijack it and calm it down. Mm. And I think that's been really, really beneficial. And then also something that, was really helpful is um, I remember my therapist at the time. So when I had PTSD, um, like I hear like a loud like bang or something like that. And I'm like mm. super anxious and I'm like on edge. Right. And I'll get so mad at myself for yeah. it. And, and um, that making, being mad about it just made it worse and entrenched in just put you in a negative mind space. And so mm. my therapist was like, when you get like that, label it. And instead of saying like, Mark, why are you, why are you so anxious? Why are you doing this? Say like, Mark, you're anxious at that point. Um, it's a normal response to abnormal situations you've Mm -hmm. been through. Like it's going to be okay. Yeah. And changing how you approach those instances. And I didn't believe my therapist at first. I was like, this is some like hokey stuff. Like (laughs) like, there's no way this is going to work. Yeah. And what happened was I started labeling it Mm -hmm. and then it became less of a task to do that. And all of a sudden I started Mm -hmm. automatically labeling it. And the next thing I know, those thoughts stopped. And next thing I know, my default was this positive thought. Mm. (laughs) And so I forgot what that's called, but that definitely was a key piece in like building up that mental framework of like just having compassion for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Self-compassion is so important. I also talk about this on another episode with uh, Felicia. A lot of voices are maybe from other people, maybe from our parents growing up, how they, you know, blame us, uh, criticize us for things. It's not necessarily coming from ourselves and recognize um, those voice, those criticism, and you don't have to associate mm-hmm. with those voice. And sometimes um, just think about if your best friend did something, you wouldn't be so harsh to say those things to them, but we would be really harsh to ourselves. I think, uh, it's a very important first step to talk to ourselves, have compassion, just like we're our own best friends. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're stuck with your thoughts 24 seven, might as well become best friends with them. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you also dabbed a little bit into Web3. Yes, <laughs> the, the dirty word, Web3. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> NFTs, ew. Yeah, so um, how do you think uh, the Web3 can le- can help data science. Yeah. So the reason why I became obsessed with Web3 is um, essentially I was just following the data. Mm. I want, as a data scientist and someone who's also dabbling in data engineering as well, it's like, where is the messiest data I can find? Where is real world data I can find? Where is a huge volume of data I can find? The blockchain, Ethereum um, particularly is one of my favorites, is a real world ledger <laughs> that's a whole bunch of actions are happening every second that anyone can have access to. Yeah. And more importantly, it's behaviors online. Mm. And so people having financial behaviors or like purchasing certain things, right? And so that's such an interesting data set. And in addition, there's like a whole bunch of fraud on there, unfortunately. And so like again, if you're like into fraud detection, right? 
there's a whole data set of real world things that you can play around with. And so uh, I recently did a blog where I use um, an A16Z NFT analyst, analyst package where I was able to pull um, NFT um, Board Ape Yacht Club, which is like one of the popular NFTs. I pulled all their data and I was able to find potential instances of uh, wash trading, which is like uh, a thing of fraud mm. um, using network graphs. Mm. Oh, that's pretty cool. It was super fun to do. And like mm. as a data nerd, like I was just having a super fun time. Yeah. But also on the other end, it's like, also, like, I wrote this code for other people to use and, and learn. They can use it for themselves to protect themselves now. Mm. I really don't care about, like, the flipping coins and flipping pictures kind of thing. Like, yeah, I bought some mainly to learn how it works. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you can go to my wallet, mayamamark.eth, <laughs> uh, and see what I bought, right? Yeah. But, um, but, like, I really don't push, like, coins or anything like that. Like, it's cool. It's fun if you have money to gamble <laughs> but the technology underlying is just so cool to me specifically decentralization mm -hmm. and um i i see it as potentially um as a new avenue for companies to build revenue streams especially with nft so you're seeing mm -hmm. this like fashion week um all these different brands have these like nft metaverse kind of offerings will it pan out who knows <laughs> what's successful might be a completely different iteration but we'll, what will stay is the underlying technology. And so me as a data professional, I'm hedging my bets on if I can understand how to analyze this underlying de technology and companies are going to make money through this technology, and I'm one of the few people that can actually analyze it really well, mm -hmm. that's going to put me in a really good position yeah. uh, to, to help people out and, and uh, make money myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Previously, we, we talked about your uh, community health advocate turned data scientist and your mission is to improve the well-being of people. So uh, what made you so passionate about this? Yeah. Wow. That's that's a really that goes deep. <laughs> that goes deep. Um, there's there's a lot of layers to that. I think uh, one of the key things is just in healthcare. There's just such a huge disparity mm. of like who's actually healthy and who's not. Many times outside of their control, you think like, oh, like if they just worked out more, oh, they just eat healthier. Well, like if food's hard to access or like it's unsafe for you to work out outside or you don't yeah. have access to a gym. Right. Um, one of the key things in community health is that one zip code determines one's life expectancy mm. <laughs> or is like as a huge driver of yeah. it. Right. And so by living literally in a different zip code, you have a different average life expectancy. That is tragic. Mm. <laughs> And so being aware of that, and then also, you know, my mom, um, you know, I'm the first one out of my immediate family to, to, to graduate from college. Um, my mom had a really hard upbringing and seeing what she had to go through to like to ride a life for me, my little yeah. brother, and also seeing my friends who are in similar situations where like, I was the one that made it out of community college and they didn't. Mm. <laughs> Why was that? Yeah. You know what? Because they were just as smart, just as talented as me, mm -hmm. but they had social pressures that really prevented them. Mm -hmm. and so that's what really got me into sociology um, in undergrad to mm -hmm. understand like all these different social problems. And then I became obsessed with healthcare yeah. um, as, a, as a way to understand that. Mm -hmm. And so I think what drives this passion is understanding that there's a problem, yeah. <laughs> that there's a discrepancy that's outside people's controls that's mm -hmm. basically off systems and um, knowing that there, there are levers in the systems that you can push and pull to help people. And that's that's what kind of got me started um, at a very high level. I can go in more detail for different things if you're interested, but um, but yeah, at a high level, that's that's what drives it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you also worked in um, health as a data analyst, and you mentioned it was really hard. So, what's specifically hard about it? Yeah. So I've had two roles in healthcare. Uh, one being a data analyst for. Um, I stand for med for, for the research. Mm -hmm. Um, that one wasn't, wasn't as hard. I think that was just because this is my first data analyst role. Yeah. And so I think the thing that really became clear to me is like, oh, wow, the data aspect is actually easy. The communicating the data is actually really hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, I remember my, I gave my boss a huge R script. I'm like, mm -hmm. here you go. <laughs> and they're like, Mark, what is this? And mm -hmm. I was like, ah, I approached this wrong for the data science side. Um, I think the, the challenge with healthcare is that, the way we collect data does not match improving people's lives oh, <laughs> in healthcare. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is all tied to revenue of, of insurance billing. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Or so, how many 
uh, medicine you sold. Yeah, yeah. So um, a lot of the data is collected through electronic health records. Mm -hmm. And um, collectively, all doctors hate electronic health records. Mm -hmm. So imagine the main source of data collection everyone hates using it yeah. <laughs> and everyone uses a different system. Mm. And so you have this really fractured system of data that's not tied to improving people's health, but tied to how do you bill for, for healthcare right. um, being collected. And that was drives healthcare. And so now when you're trying to analyze those data sets um, is the hardest part is not even like analyzing it. It's getting the data and preparing it. And then once you have that, the gravity of what you're working with in healthcare is like, these are people's lives you can impact. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of regulation, whether it be HIPAA, some other things. And so something I'm really excited about recently in the past couple of weeks, the FDA came out with rulings for um, essentially like digital health companies on like mm -hmm. how, what considers a medical device for like AI yeah. solutions, right? Um, that gives a lot more clarity on what, what you can and can't do mm -hmm. or like what steps you need to take to do it correctly. Right. Um, and so I think, uh, healthcare just has such a, a slow adoption of machine learning and AI mm -hmm. because one, it's hard to get the correct data. And then two, it's hard to properly like clinically validate it's safe. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so it's just a really, really messy problem. I mm -hmm. joke around that you have to be a masochist to be in healthcare. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, then it makes sense. It's really hard um, for a data scientist to change the industry and now with whom you're still helping people um improve their uh, behavior um through data so yeah. that's uh, behavior change behavior change yeah yeah and i think it was actually really scary for me to move out of healthcare because like mm -hmm. i devoted so much of my life and my master's to, to healthcare, and so like i built up all this domain knowledge that's really hard to get and to walk away from it that was like a, such a hard decision, but I was like, let me just try something new. It's still behavior change. I get to learn how to scale a product to impact people through behavior change. And what I found actually is like, oh, I'm actually not really as obsessed about healthcare as I thought I was originally. Mm. I'm more obsessed with just data. Yeah. And healthcare can be a facet of that, mm -hmm. but not the only facet. And the, if anything, it was more empowering because now I'm like, there are way more problems that I can approach with data. Yeah. So how do you see your future yeah, that's a really good question. I've been doing a lot of soul searching recently yeah. <laughs> on, on this, on this. Mm. Uh, and uh, as I told you before, like I tried, I tried building companies before. Mm -hmm. um, and like the last company I tried to build, uh, me and my co-founders, like we, we made it all the way to like the interview rounds of Y Combinator. Oh, wow. And like we built an MVP and mm -hmm. we're like trying to like sell the customers, right? So like doing the whole startup thing wasn't wasn't making any money, mm -hmm. right? But still make it that far, I was like, wow, right? We ultimately decided that it's actually the business model is broken and we couldn't pursue it. But for the longest, I was like, I want to be a founder. I want to do that. And, and, and shout out to my co-founders because he, he went off and did his own thing afterwards and raised his first round, which wow. is like so exciting for him. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that's that's really cool to see. Um, but I recently realized, similar to me not wanting to be a doctor, I don't want to be a founder. Mm. <laughs> um, and the reason being was um, I've been talking to a lot of like uh, people in the space. I was like, what do I actually want to solve? I, I want to solve social problems at scale. And if I become a founder, I'm stuck on one problem for nine years if it's mm -hmm. successful. Yeah. <laughs> and what if I choose the wrong problem? And I yeah. actually talked to a venture capitalist about mm -hmm. this. And the reason was that I wanted to become a founder to learn how to scale a company. So I know that process to scale over and over again for other companies, mm -hmm. right? And he was like, then why don't you just do that? Yeah. <laughs> why don't you just go into venture capital if that's mm -hmm. what you really want to do? Mm -hmm. And so something that's kind of like on my long-term kind of career career goal is like, how can I get involved in, in venture capital mm. as a way to um, find kind of like really up and coming companies who are trying to solve these nasty problems? And maybe it's not directly tied to social impact, but it's like innovation that can can lead to social impact. And how can this be invested in multiple different startups and support them? Um, and that is that matches my personality, like that systems thinking um, and that's, that's kind of like left field. It's like not necessarily data, mm -hmm. but, um, still very tied, tied to that. And so, um, that's something really in the past few weeks I've realized. Uh, and so that's something that I'm really exploring right now. Um, complete career shift. I don't know how I make that happen, Yeah. but, um, that's something that I'm exploring kind of long-term, um, immediate term is, you know, I really want to grow in data engineering. Mm -hmm. I really love data engineering. 
I love thinking about data infrastructure um, and and specifically like data ops. That's the area that I'm really focusing a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my informational interviews I do for like thinking about my career are with people building data infrastructure. Yeah. And so um, so long term VC. <laughs> short term is how can I get more embedded in data engineering, data ops? Mm, yeah. And I know a lot of uh, investors, they like to talk to uh, practitioners yeah. to understand the industry, the space. And then sometimes they'll hire like consultant or part-time uh, writers to do some research. So maybe that's something you can start with to contribute some your um, insights and then uh, maybe um, look at some deals with them together on the data and the developer tooling space. Definitely. And that's why I really like creating content on LinkedIn mm -hmm. is because it gives me a platform to talk to people. Yeah. And I'll be like, hey, I'm thinking about writing this post. I'm thinking about writing this blog. Can mm -hmm. I just chat with you? Yeah. And the advice I receive is why I'm talking, like able to talk to VCs mm -hmm. is like, hey, I'm, I'm writing a blog. I'm trying to do some research. Like what deals are you investing in? Yeah. Why did you invest in them? Mm -hmm. What's your career path? Um, and again, just a whole bunch of informational interviews trying to learn and also just talking to also data practitioners. So mm -hmm. I love my favorite people to talk to is so the that that the article like data science is the sexiest job of the twenty first mm. century. I think I think it came out like twenty eleven. <laughs> yeah, um, it's like the most misleading yeah, title. Right? I love finding people who are in data mm -hmm. well before the article came out mm -hmm. because they were doing data before it was cool. Yeah, <laughs> I love talking to those people because they have a really good sense outside the hype mm -hmm. of what data is and how to drive value with data. Those are the people I seek and try to talk to all the time and learn from them for like how I can grow my career. Yeah. And what do you think about the future of data science? That's that's a good question. I've been I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I think we've come to this this conclusion that like wow, data science and production is mm -hmm. really hard. You cannot just hire a bunch of data scientists and they sprinkle their data science magic and all of a sudden start printing money. That's not yeah. the case. I think it's really going to be moving towards that's just a one subset of a data team. But there's going to be way more emphasis on like data engineering and ML ops and all those aspects. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think the focus is going to move away from the data scientists being the center of it. Yeah. And and rightfully so, a whole data team and what it takes to drive kind of driving value within the company as a data team. Mm -hmm. And so I think if anything, not that data science has become less popular, but it's not going to be like the shining kind of thing that everyone's all talking about. It's not right. going to be the sexiest job of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be a facet of a data team driving value. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot of support roles to enable data science. Yeah. Uh, so before we wrap up, for folks who want to find you and continue to follow your journey, where can they find you? Um, LinkedIn is probably the, the best place to to find me I, I post every day mm -hmm. um, basically um sharing funny data memes yeah. as well as uh my insights so like you say you, you talk about this post i made about like the five lessons i learned um for data strategy yeah, that's a great <laughs> recently post. is like um if you follow me i'm you're gonna follow along my journey and what i'm currently learning as you mm -hmm. see like I'm, I'm very open about my mistakes and what i'm learning and where where my shortcomings are and where i'm like where my strengths are I'm going to share that really raw with you. And so um, there, it's really cool because like, I've, I've seen people where I started posting two years ago mm -hmm. and I, I talked to them again. They're like, yeah. whoa, I've seen you go from this point to this point. Yeah. It's because I'm so transparent about the, the journey I, I'm on. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I, I hope my, my main focus is how can I provide value to everyone yeah. um, that where they click on a post they get value from it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what I, I, I go to. And then also you'll probably be the first to know when like when I drop like a blog or like a tutorial that's way more in depth to help you out with data science stuff. Yeah, awesome. Well, I learned a lot from our conversation. Thank you so much for coming to Data Scientist Show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It was super fun.